Well, good day, Max here again. Welcome back to the shop. So today we're going to be working on these rollers. They're off a small uh, turntable, and they're very old and they are irreplaceable. These are from the 1940s, and we've got to do a repair on them where the rust has eaten away the outer surface of them. So we'll swing down, we'll have a look and we'll go through our various repair options that are available to me that I have in my shop to get the job done and hopefully in some sort of a fashion that we do not make a complete pig's ass of it and totally destroy these parts. I'm sure the owner would not be impressed. So our rollers here, this is a good one which has been deemed acceptable for use. So it has this spherical shaped outside diameter. Now this one just has some minor uh, rust pitting from where it's been sitting for a lot of years. However, the two that we have to repair have major rust pitting on just uh, well at least half of the outside diameter. So that's what we have to correct and make it like that. Now these are case hardened on the outside. Right file will not touch them on the inside still soft so luckily enough we have one which was completely stuffed and it's only got a small section which is still you know semi reasonable so this is going to be our test subject so I've gone in with the grinder and I've taken out all of the uh, rust pitting and just to give us our best chance uh, when we play around with a repair procedure. So the best options, well my options will be as follows. So going in with a stick welder, regardless of what type of electrode you use, I think it's going to be a bit haphazard and put a very lot of localised heat into the area as this needs to be quite a crisp edge. So stick welder is not a option I want to pursue. MIG welder, quite possible. So this is on the... Um, possible list. Now bear in mind these rollers in their application will be uh, not used as they were initially designed for as this will be a static display piece of equipment rather than an operational piece of equipment. That being said they still have to move but so if our build up is not hard like the original it's not going to matter so MIG welder a good possibility and we can just do short spurts let the part cool off keep going like that so next on our list will be TIG welder so this will give us a very controllable weld weld build up and we can control the temperature as well same as with the MIG welder by just doing small areas at a time and let the part cool down now if we go with the TIG welder I'd most likely use uh, a stainless steel rod so that is a very viable option and it could be the option we go with so why stainless steel 
I've got two options, stainless or ER70. So the stainless rods that I have are a smaller diameter and will allow for a, or for me to put down a finer weld. And I think it's possibly going to be a, a better suited filler rod for this unknown steel. The ER70 would probably be alright as well, but it's a bigger diameter rod, so um, not as easy for me to put down a finer, smaller, more controlled TIG bead. But that being said, we can try both on our test subject, just to make sure, and that's why we have a test subject. So another option is oxyacetylene weld, braze them. I'm not going to go this route because it's going to put way too much heat into the part and uh, that's what I want to avoid. So we will not be using the oxyacetylene method regardless of what type of filler material we choose. Right, next option. Eutectic Uteloy Torch. Metal spray. This is a... A good option for repairs but however in this case because of the higher temperatures required for the initial bonding for the powder regardless of what powder you use with this style of torch I feel it's going to put too much heat into the part it's along the same lines as the oxyacetylene torch uh, but these are an excellent option for other types of repair. So our last option is the Eutectic Rototech torch. So this is a spray weld process. And this has the advantage of being a low temperature process, which is, would suit our part the best. However, the process for this to work, you ideally need a, an even surface for it to run on and also a full diameter surface. So you would apply this uh, in the lathe with the part or another machine with the part rotating. Now also as there's quite a depth of build up in some spots you do need to use uh, an underlay process as well which it's recommended due to the, the, the thickness in build up but this does have the advantage of the uh, low temp application so it's not really suited for this however we will be looking at the possibility of using this to repair our seal groove there'll be one up that end as well in this part here so that's for another video. So going back to the choice between MIG and TIG, if you look into it, cost effectiveness. So is one process going to be way more expensive than the other? Or is it going to be much of a muchness? As far as the welding goes, the MIG welding is a lot cheaper than TIG welding as it's a lot quicker process to do. However, the end result you could be faced with a bit more cleanup. <coughs> oh, excuse me. And you don't know what's going to happen with the alloying effect between the base metal that's hardened and your filler. So when you come to clean up in the lathe, are we going to have the fusion area of the weld unmachinable? So then that means we've got to go to a grinding procedure, which is very expensive. TIG welding, a lot longer process, more expensive, gas is more expensive, your rods are more expensive. But if we went to a stainless steel rod with the TIG, would we still have the same alloying process on the 
if he's in line or not. We don't know. So that's what we're going to try with our test subject. So I'll probably do a little bit with the MIG welder and a little bit with the TIG welder using both the ER70 and the stainless steel. So I think that's the route I'm going to go. Now there are several other repair options available as well for this type of um, repair, but none of them I consider a cost effective way when you consider what the part is going to be used for, and that is a static display. So, I mean, there's options you could um, have the parts annealed and sleeve them. You could have the parts annealed and put on and machine them back and put on a full weld build-up of a hardenable um, welding material, which is available. Um, there would be more specialised but very expensive rods available, most likely in the eutectic range, which would be more suited and they are very expensive and, like I say, not cost effective for the type of um, job that we're going to do here. So, as I said, my options are not the only options available. There are many other options, but with what I have in my shop to do this the most cost-effective way for the customer, um, the route I've discussed is the route we will be using. Okay, here's the first experimental run on part of the corroded area with a MIG. Now, it was hard to keep the welding tidy as the, well, due to the amount we had to grind out underneath, so it was all different levels. So let's just machine a bit of this back and uh, we'll have a look. I'm not going to film the machining of all the experimental parts, but we will be filming the machining of the final parts. Right, so our build-up with the MIG welder appears to have been very successful. Uh, we're not having any issues with um, hardness and, and some weird alloying effect from this material to our weld. We're still, the edge of our weld there is still soft. So we haven't machined any crown on it yet. We've just cut the part uh, straight across um, to the major diameter of the crown. We're just a bit above it, so there's still a clean up cut to go. So as far as the MIG goes, success. So what I might do is just We'll come around to the opposite end round here and I'll build a section of this up with the stainless steel wire with the TIG and machine it back and see how that goes. But there's a fair chance we'll just complete this job with the MIG. But let's try the um, stainless steel wire and TIG first. Okay, we've got our stainless steel area uh, just temper you know, partially built up and machined down just for a trial. And, I mean, I could still tidy up the edges yet. Interesting enough, the stainless steel went really hard and it was um, not the easiest uh, to machine, but it did machine okay. So, compared to the MIG, which is on here, I think the uh, using the TIG appeared to put a lot more heat in, which is uh, what I don't want. We're able to keep the heat down fairly well with the MIG and plus it was much easier to machine. So that's a really interesting uh, result. So what we'll do is the um, other ones that we have to do, we'll do the build up on these with the MIG. It's just a far quicker process and machining is uh, far quicker and easier. So as we said before, it's, all, it's a static display, so it's all about keeping the cost um, in check. So anyway, I'll get set up and we'll uh, build the other ones up.
So we'll just do small runs like we have done up the side of the part. And we'll let that cool off to, so we can uh, at least touch it. And then we'll just do another one and we'll just keep going like that. If we get these too hot, the bore, we may have issues like with the bore getting a bit of shrinkage as well. So we'll just do these short, um, short runs and let them cool off in between. Interesting thing to note too on these, these have been uh, copper coated, so that's what the yellow um, discolouring is on them. So probably some sort of corrosion protection, I don't know, as it was done like many, many years ago. So not sure what their thought process uh, was behind it, but yeah. So when we did the first welds um, on the uh, corners around here, you would have seen me stop, start, stop, start, stop, start, you know, just pulsing the trigger. And that's to stop us um, overheating and burning away the corners. And really that's the only time you can do it, is on something really thin or on a corner. If you were to do that like on a thicker section, you run a very good risk of having uh, multiple um, cold laps. That's where the weld just sits on top of the um, base material and just doesn't penetrate. But you can get away with it on a corner or like on very thin materials. And then, um, yeah, the rest is just uh, stringer, straight stringer runs on the outside. So I'll um, continue on now and get these the welding completed. And... Uh, or I'll bring you back when we're ready to head over to the lathe. And of course, the last run around the outside will be a pulsing trigger um, weld, the same as the uh, initial ones around here. So on our roller, if our build-up area was smooth like this and didn't have all the undulations from grinding out the rust, the weld build-up would be more like this. <clears throat> or if so that's going radially 
which is not my preferred way on something like that. That's all right if you're using it in a rotator. Um, my preference would actually be to go crossways if it's just a um, depending on the length of the part and well it all depends on the part as well. I'll do a couple of couple of runs going the other way. Right, we'll take a look at that. So welding it radially around on a, on a smooth flat level surface, you do get a far more even build up. But on something round, my, probably, my preference is to go uh, axially lengthways ac across um, because it's, it's easier to do. Um, also, if you look up Caterpillar welding procedures, that's their preferred method as well, so um, either or, but it depends on the shape of the part and what you're doing and that, but I mean, I'm by no means an A-grade welder, but um, I get by with my, well, what I know. So, our parts now are ready to go into the lathe and have all their ugliness machined off. So we end up with uh, something resembling this surface here with its radius crown. So let's head over to the lathe. Okay, let's uh, get this weld machine down to the, um, the larger part of the crown diameter. And as you can see, we've just got a bolt and a, or a spacer and our part bolted onto a spigot. So... Just going to take it steady, steady, light cuts, slow feed. Okay, we're down to size and the tool is just rubbing on the uh, hardened part on the outside here. Let's see if we can get these uh, faces cleaned up. Okay, I think that's all we're going to get out of that one. Now we'll do the back one.
Okay, we got there. We're just going to use this radius tool to blend the uh, two radiuses back up to the crown. What I'll do is I think I'll mark this area with a um, sharpie so I know it's easier for me to see when if the tool contacts it. See, we're just starting to rub on the first half. A bit more to go on the back half. And we're rubbing all the way across so that's as close as we can um, get the crowning on this side feels quite good so I'll do the other half Okay, I think that's got it. We'll give this a uh, polish up and have a uh, bit of a look. Okay, that's our crown put on, completed. Um, our blend line for the weld is uh, through here. And uh, through here, you can just see a little mark there and there, but uh, it's good result. So that's this one done. So with all the uh, welding around the outside, it's bound to have had some effect on our bore. So we we only welded for approximately 50% of the OD so we, we are going to get a bit of shrinkage 
and that's part of the reason why I wanted to keep the heat to its minimum as well so we wouldn't well hopefully it would be of less an effect and you don't really know till the the things cool down and completed what sort of um, distortion it's going to happen to the bore so just checking it through here now I did measure the bores before we welded and they were 1.575 now we are 1.571 so sorry 1.5755 and we're 1.571 on our tightest spot here so we've got a four four and a half thou to take out of this bore so we'll put a boring bar through and we'll start um, we'll take off the high spots now there is a um, there's a bearing that goes in there that has to be pressed into that bore and my other concern is uh, this nut that goes around the outside so I'll have to get hold of the owner and get him to drop me off the nuts. So we need to make sure they still screw in to the threads. Um, if they don't, we have a couple of options open to us. Um, let's just deal with the bore first and then we'll get to the thread. Okay, so that's cleaned up three quarters of the way around. So we'll get a measurement across the two points where we have a, a clean up. We're only a couple of tenths under there. Let's try it in a different spot. I'd say if we just give that a light emery, we're going to be there. sticking my finger in holes with a bit of emery sometimes it's all right but uh, there's a little notch here where a locking screw goes and it's quite likely to grab the emery and my finger so let's not take the chance
one five seven five five. Just a hair over one five seven five five. Okay. Um, just a quick note: these telescopic gauges, uh, regardless of what, what people tell you, just put them in once and follow them through, like this, and then take your measurement. Some diameters, you actually have to wiggle them and feel them through. So like going side to side, get a bit of tension, pull them back out, go side to side and make sure the thing is recentered. Because some diameters on some some of these are gauges, not very often, but they'll, they'll tend to hang up slightly off centre and you'll get a misreading. Fact of life with telescopic gauges, so don't always believe, put it straight in and, and rock it through and pull it out that the gauge is on centre, because um, it's not always the case. So with regards to the thread, um, quite often, well, one good option, if you just got a couple of thou to take out, is one of these. These are a handheld thread chaser. And you just grip them by your hand with the lathe running slow and uh, run them through the thread like that it's similar to a thread file um, and these are great especially if you're cutting a thread too and you just want to get the uh, form correct but we can't use it in this case because of this uh, semicircle where a grub screw um, locking screw screws in which is uh, on here so it's not going to work. So the only way to pick up on this thread is to single point it. Um, these thread chasers are available for external um, threads as well. And for an external thread, um, you'd use it similar to a wood lathe. So you'd, you'd have a tool rest and follow your thread along, of course, with a uh, proper handle on the end, which is currently on this one. Right, so this part's done, so I need to, I shall leave this one in here, and no, I won't, I'll take, uh, I'll take it out, then I can just finish off the rest of it, I'll give them a quick zip over with the um, scotch Bright wheel, and uh, we, we'll get the um, nuts and test fit the nuts. Right, that's this job complete. In the end, I, I did get the owner to drop down the uh, bearing retainer nuts and I just had to chase out the threads uh, inside a few thou. Uh, I just did it with a single point um, threading bar. I didn't film that because there's no way a camera was going to get in there and see with a boring bar and my head in the way and uh, electric light <laughs> to see. So unfortunately, yeah. It only took a couple of thou to take them out. So, these are, are complete, ready to go back on to the um, part that they go on. Also, just knocked out another little quick job for them. This is just a series of um, threaded plugs. So, he, can cut the, he wants to cut them off and put the uh, screwdriver slot in himself. So, he can merrily saw away here and... Merrily cut a slot in. It's just a uh, blanking plug. This is another part of the same thing. Just goes in there. Well. And they get cut off. All right. Okay, well that's um, that one completed. So um, 
the owners will be very happy to have his parts back. Um, I'll put a couple of um, clips in at the end of the um, thing that these belong to. I've been calling it a tractor. I know there's some strange YouTube policies. You've got to be a bit careful uh, on certain subjects. <laughs> um, but, yeah. So, jobs like this is a, a bit of a typical job, I guess, for um, small shops. So you've got to have your wits about you. Uh, which way you proceed with this sort of thing. So anyway, we got through it no problem whatsoever. So as I said, um, yeah, we'll put a couple of shots of the uh, said tractor <laughs> at the end here. And what they do, or well, these rollers are off a turntable off it, and they take the, they can take the two wheels off, I believe, and then it puts it on a three-legged tripod. And then the thing can swivel around and point wherever they want it to point. <laughs> so anyway, cheers. Thanks for watching. And uh, well, hopefully see you next video. Or you'll see me. Cheers.